Sefer Matutinus in Veniat. Ive in quam Lucifer quin escito casum, Christus filius tuus, qui regressus ab inferis, humano generis serenus iluxit, et tecum vivit et regnat in secula seculorum. Reverend Gabriele Amorth made headlines around the world recently when he said the devil was present in the Vatican. You're talking about something very real, aren't you? Absolutely, very real. As to the devil's presence in the Vatican, he says that's no surprise. He once had to perform an exorcism on another exorcist. The first thing we need to do if we're going to find out if the devil is at the Vatican is take a tour underneath the Vatican. As we arrive underneath the Vatican, we see that it is laid out in a number of rooms marked by letters, as we can see in this aerial view map. As we move to room U, here we find the shock of all shocks. Here on the wall, it says there is a depiction of Lucifer, that is, the light bearer the morning star. On the opposite of the wall there is a drawing of Vesper, the evening star, cosmic symbol of the human life cycle. We find out that when we get to room U, here we have a clear depiction of Lucifer underneath the Vatican at St. Peter's Basilica. We ask ourselves why are they keeping this image of Lucifer underneath the Vatican? Again, you would think if you're a Christian church, you would not want to have any of these images. They'll go on and say, oh, well, we're saving it because it's a UNESCO heritage site or something like that. This is always their excuse, saving it for the sake of art. But for the true Christian, this is not an excuse because we know if you're giving glory and propaganda to false deities and false pagan gods, what are you doing? You're in essence supporting the evil spiritual realm. This cannot be from God. And since Rome claims itself to be the one true church, you would think they would lead by example. But what kind of example is this? That you have a depiction of Lucifer underneath the Vatican for countless hundreds and hundreds of years? Now this image here underneath the Vatican has been there since their claim which would be Constantine, we would know that he was the first one that built this uh, basilica. And so again, we ask ourselves, why are they keeping this depiction of Lucifer underneath the Vatican? On the other, the figure of Moses leads us directly to God. And thus, to the transcendent leads us directly to God. This is the last day of the Pope's visit. Now, since he's been here, he's said and done a lot of things. But the thing that stuck out to me the most is something he said during, I guess it was a mass, where he came out and said that the life of Jesus ultimately ended in failure, in the failure on the cross. And if at times our efforts and work seem to fail, 
and not produce fruit, we need to remember that we are followers of Jesus Christ and his life, humanly speaking, ended in failure, the failure of the cross. Then he went on to talk about the dangers of being uh, comfortable with uh, surroundings and things such as that, which is a whole nother topic in and of itself. But he says the failure of Jesus, the failure of the cross, even though the Bible clearly states that Jesus knew what was going to happen to him, as uh, far as the cross was concerned, how he is going to lay his life down. He even said, Lord, if it is your will, take this bitter cup from me, but not your will, but not my will, your will be done. And particularly, we know this when we look at John 17 and 18. Therefore doth my father love me, because I laid my life down, that I might take it again. No man taketh it from me, but I lay it down myself. Which is to say, nobody took his life from him on the cross. He laid it down willingly. He knew what was going to happen to him. So to say that his life in general, the cross in particular, was a failure is something I'm very disappointed to see from a supposed spiritual leader. The Secretary General of the United Nations has invited the Pope to address this distinguished assembly of nations. In my own name and that of the entire Catholic community. Repeat that again. Yes, the very first remarks out of his, his mouth, the translator will say it. I flipped out, Alex. I was, he says, I come to you in my own name, in the name of the Catholic community. He did not come in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. I never saw him do the sign of the cross while he was here, any of that stuff. This guy is an imposter. I am come in my Father's name, and you receive me not. If another shall come in his own name, him you will receive. In my own name and that of the entire Catholic community. So there he said it, in my own name and in the entire Catholic community. That's who he's coming in the name of. He's not saying he's coming in the name of God or the Father or Jesus Christ or the Holy Spirit. He's just keeping it to him. So he's personalizing. And call no man your father upon the earth, for one is your father which is in heaven. so bizarre how the Catholics will twist this and just eliminate the second commandment from the Ten Commandments. And they still have to come up with ten. Because in Deuteronomy 10.4, this list is called the Ten Commandments. So you can't walk away with nine of them. But the Roman Catholics don't want to acknowledge this second commandment. And not even the Lutherans want to acknowledge this second commandment that says not to make a graven image. You know why? Because their church is filled with graven images. Because their house is filled with graven images. Because their yard has a shrine of a graven image in it. And they do bow down themselves unto those graven images. So, of course, they don't want to acknowledge this second commandment. It's an inconvenient commandment for them. So they want to kind of hide it and kind of just tuck it away. So in order to come up, and, and this is so bizarre, it boggles the mind. But in order to come up with an extra commandment, they got to find a commandment somewhere else to make it add up to 10. So here's what they do. Jump ahead to the 10th commandment, which is thou shalt not covet. And by the way, let me say this. In the, in the New Testament, Jesus quotes this commandment multiple times as simply thou shalt not covet. So all throughout the New Testament, this commandment's just always just pretty much quoted as thou shalt not covet, over and over again. But yet the Roman Catholics have decided to just cut this commandment in half and split it into two so that they can hide the commandment about graven images. Priest Andrew Pinsent holds advanced degrees in theology from the Pontifical Gregorian University in Rome, as well as a doctorate in particle physics from Oxford. 
In January 2015, he wrote, Being both a priest and a former particle physicist at CERN, I am often asked to give talks on faith and science. Quite often, young people ask me the following question. How can you be a priest and believe in the Big Bang? To which I am delighted to respond. We invented it. Or more precisely, priest Georges Lemaitre invented the theory that is today called the Big Bang, and everyone should know about him. The author of the Big Bang Theory was none other than the Jesuit-trained priest Georges Lemaitre. On October 28, 2014, Sarah Kerr reported, Speaking to members of the Pontifical Academy of Science, the Pope said it is possible to believe in both, insisting God was responsible for the Big Bang from which all life evolved. L'inizio del mondo non è opera del caos che deve a un altro la sua origine, ma deriva direttamente da un principio supremo che crea per amore. Il Big Bang che oggi si pone all'origine del mondo, non contraddice l'intervento creatore divino, ma lo esige. L'evoluzione nella natura non contrasta con la nozione di creazione, perché l'evoluzione presuppone la creazione degli esseri che si evolvono. Revelation 17, verse 4. And the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet color, and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand full of abominations and the filthiness of her fornication. First clue, purple and scarlet color. And the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet color. You can see the bishops wear purple and the cardinals wear scarlet, the red color, as you see in the Vatican. The next clue was she's decked with gold and precious stones and pearls. She has many riches. How rich is the Vatican, says International Business Times? So wealthy it can stumble across millions of euros just tucked away. There's tons of articles on how the Vatican has just immense amount of money in paintings and art and gold and jewels. Everything about the Catholic Church is very ornamental. And I saw the woman drunken with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I wondered with great admiration. If you did not already know, the Catholic Church in the Dark Ages killed millions of Christians because they wanted to remain in power. For two or three centuries, many Protestants have given figures concerning the total number of people killed directly or indirectly by the papacy during the Middle Ages. 50, 68, 100, 120, 150 million people. Roman Catholics typically give much smaller numbers, so they don't deny that it happened. So again, looking back to Revelation, the blood of the saints and martyrs are on the Vatican's hands. But here's where it gets undeniable. I said this is irrefutable, undeniable evidence that we are in the end times and St. John's revelation is coming true. He says the seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sitteth. Oh, it's Rome. Okay, the city of seven hills. Let's look further. During the point at which St. John had this revelation, he said there are seven kings. Five are fallen or dead. One is currently a king, and the other has not yet come. And when he does come, he must continue a short space. This is the irrefutable evidence that I want to show to you guys. Seven kings. Let's look at the Vatican's history. In 1929, the Lateran Treaty was signed. Being that the Vatican is a priest-king state, the Pope is not only a religious leader, he is also king. So in 1929, the Pope at that time was the first king. 
let's take a look at the list of popes. So I'm going to scroll all the way down here to the current Pope Francis. Here we go. And let's scroll up to 1929. Here we go. February 6, 1922 to February 1939. So he was the first king. So let's just do simple counting. First king. Second king. Third king. Fourth king. Fifth king. The sixth king. Let's go back and see what it says about the sixth king. Five are fallen and one is. So we look at the sixth king. He is. And the seventh will come later and he'll serve a short time. Who was the seventh? Benedict. What did he do? He quit his position early. One of the first popes, I think, in over 200 years to leave his position. The popes die in the papacy. They, they die in their position. He was, it shocked the world when he left his position. And look what it says about the kings. There were seven kings from 1929. Five are dead. One is Pope John Paul II, and the other has not yet come. And when he does come, he'll quit early. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. This is irrefutable to me. Now let's look at this guy, Francis. And the beast that was and is not, even he is the eighth, and is one of the seven, and goeth into perdition. This is in reference to Satan. He is the false prophet. He is the last pope. That is the main message. Revelation is about end times. And this section here, 17.10, Revelation 17.10, about the kings that lines up directly with the Vatican getting its sovereignty in 1929 and pinning it to the exact pope who would quit early, which is not a common occurrence. Guys, got to open your eyes here. And whoever shall exalt himself shall be abased, and he that shall humble himself shall be exalted. But woe unto you, scribes and you Pharisees, hypocrites, for you shut up the kingdom of heaven against men. For ye neither go in yourselves, neither suffer ye them that are entering to go in. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you devour widows' houses, and for a pretense make long prayer. Therefore ye shall receive the greater damnation. Woe unto you, scribes and you Pharisees, hypocrites! For you compass sea and land to make one proselyte. And when he is made, you have made him twofold more the child of hell than yourselves. Those who try and hide their plans from the Lord are doomed. They carry out their schemes in secret and think no one will see them or know what they are doing. They turn everything upside down. You're looking at the Vatican in St. Peter's Square. St. Peter's Square is in the shape of a keyhole. The Vatican itself is in the shape of an upside down cross. This is truly the devil's church that has misappropriated and hidden the keys to the kingdom of heaven. Even the name St. Peter's Basilica gives away the identity of Satan's church. Basilica, the origination of the word, means a place of a king. The word basilisk refers to a serpent described as a dragon that can kill by its breath or look. Basilica translates into the abode of the basilisk, which is the abode of the serpent, the royal serpent, the serpent that wears a crown. As you view the entirety of the Vatican itself, the upside down cross, at the head of the cross, the head of the serpent becomes visible the conspicuously placed circles for the eyes of the serpent, as well as the square window for the exit of the tongue on the mouth of the serpent becomes obvious. It is truly the abode of the serpent. The dome on the top of the Vatican becomes the crown of the serpent, truly hidden in plain sight. 
The entirety of the Vatican is an upside down cross with a serpent at the head of the cross wearing a crown. This is truly the church of Satan and the keys to the kingdom of heaven have been hidden by Satan himself in the form of one of the largest Christian churches in the entire world boasting of over 1.2 billion members, deceived by Satan himself. Woe unto you Pharisees and teachers of the law, for you have taken away the key to knowledge. You don't go in yourselves, and you've kept those who are trying to enter from entering. Your damnation shall be the worst.